thank you very much for the opportunity you're giving us to present our work in this international conference. We are very pleased to present to you the work, the multimodal analysis to children's voices. This work is presented by me, Fernanda Liberali, Emilia Cipriando, my friend who is here, and also Sandra Cavaletti, whose work at the school has provided us the data for this presentation. So we thank you all and hope you can enjoy our presentation today. We are very pleased to present to you this work that discusses multimodal strategies to resist the power and the knowledge frameworks that try to take kids from the central position in the development of an idea of what childhood is that represses children's voices and that's what we are here for to resist this kind of situation in order to do that we take a dialectical perspective that looks at the experiences of these children in the world creating with the world creating with the family creating with the community so we believe that these kids in a changing world they change themselves and change the world while they are being changed by the world. And this process of change will change us, the researchers, as well. So we are going to study these cultures of childhood, the, those cultures that aim at designing meaning through different multimodal aspects that the kids are going to engage with in order to produce meaning, to produce culture. What is it that the kids say? How do they say it? How do they create meaning in the world where they are and this will provide us with an idea of a resistance to epistemic and social political subjugation of these kids because we believe they have agency they have positionality and we have to create spaces for these kids to have their voices and our research is going to show how these voices can be overlooked sometimes and how these voices can also be expanded many times through process that are created with kids school and families together so our re our work is developed through what we call a critical collaborative research this is a pedagogical process of doing research that involves the the researcher and the whole community in which he is he or she is participating intervening in what we call unfair conditions in order to find solutions together with the participants together with people and so both ac academic life and the real life of people in everyday lives are changed in this process of research development so this is what we call a theoretical and methodological processes that put people together in the construction of meaning and this will be done by using the resources that people have so we will look at tone of voice facial expression body movement choices of color of proximity of words of intonation all these things guiding the way we interpret data and we understand what we mean by cultures of childhood the data we are presenting comes from a country that you know, Brazil, that is undergoing horrible situations now, but which has a potential for creating transformation. We focus on the state of Sao Paulo, which is the richest state in Brazil, in the city of Sao Paulo, one of the most populated cities in the world, where we have this public school. This public school is, is located in the center of the city and in and it's of course it provides education for people who are underprivileged so people who sometimes don't have access to the minimal conditions of living like food job a place of living or internet connections so what we are going to show you now is is how we create space for these kids in this context to develop their learning rights as stated by the common basis for education in the country in this way we believe that we will create possibilities to understand what goes on within the school and also within their homes during the pandemic what we see in this 
learning rights is that we have to create for kids opportunities to uh, coexist, to connect to others, to express themselves, to explore different possibilities, to participate in the world and to play around with their colleagues, with their parents, with everyone around. This has to be guaranteed so that these kids can have experiences and they can develop preferences. They can create autonomous ways of dealing with the world to have choices for who they want to be and how they want to act in the world. So for this specific presentation, we will address four questions. The first one has to do with how these kids appropriate the discussions about important issues of life before and after the pandemic. Has anything changed? The other one is what, is, what are the differences that are most striking in these two different moments? How does multimodality, the, way, the voice, the way the voices are expressed, the way the, the kids move, the way the kids, uh, the facial expressions, expressions of the kids, how do this show these differences? And finally, how do, does this multimodal perception contribute to process of teacher education and action? The data we have then has to do with a group of five and six year old kids in a public preschool before the pandemic in the school and after and during the pandemic while they were having remote education at home mediated by their parents who normally had very limited connection to the internet and normally one cell phone or sometimes very rarely, but sometimes a computer that they can use for the whole family. So some of the practices we have in this case can be seen in this picture that you look here. In the picture you can see in the first part before the pandemic, the kids together involved in very freeing activities in which they can participate and act and get involved. They can have movement, they can work together. In the second part, you can see during remote education, kids involved in very mechanical kinds of practices, mainly involved with the development of reading skills through very uh, re re reproductive kinds of activities. In these two videos that we are going to show now, you will have a chance to feel these differences. Look, pay attention to the movement of the kids, to the sound of their voices, how they participate, how they connect. In both moments, you will have an opportunity, even with the Portuguese speaking, to have the feeling of the differences that we are going to talk about in a few minutes. Look how they move around, how they interact, how they work together, mediated by the teacher and by the other school students. Now look at doing remote education mediated by the parents who are doing their best to make kids have contact with education. Mais uma linha, só sair bem retinho até a hora que você fazer direitinho. Vamos? Até! Vamos, sem preguiça. Vai, Marco Júnior. Começa a fazer de novo, mais uma linha. So the boy does not want to do it anymore. He says, again, more. And the mother says, yes, a little bit more. Let's do very correctly, very perfect. So small ball. Small slash, small ball, small slash, and then he goes on. In these two scenes, we can have the constraints reproduced by the way the kid acts with the writing process. And in the other one, how kids connect to one another and create meaning together in the play, in the playground. This can be seen in, in these two pictures that we visualize here. Before the pandemic, we would say, excuse us, Big for this, but we are playing. That's the idea of freedom, of creating together and making meaning in a different and very singular way that the kids have to do. After the pan during the pandemic, what we have is something similar to what you can see in the second slide, in the second side, the left side of the slide, which says, Tomorrow we are going to use cloth bags to create something and the kids start imagining different things. But then after the class, they leave the class with this 
pencil box made of bags all the same. So in a way, that's the difference we see between what is going on during the pandemic and what happened before. The kids are reproducing different ways of acting. They are doing orthographic, orthographic training, very repetitive ones, very motor oriented kind of activities because the families are anxious that their kids are not going to learn how to read. And they are aware of the need for these kids to learn how to read. They are also also very limited in terms of the kinds of songs they sing, the things that they play around with, kid, young, young girls playing girls kind of plays and boys, boys kinds of play, because that is the tradition that the families live, that's the culture of the family, and it's not being, they are not being mediated by other possibilities in an intercultural process. So what we have and what we can see is that this childhood is a social phenomenon, not an individual phenomenon. And so we can see that what we, we are having now is children as parents' exclusive responsibility, as if they were the child, the, the parents' property. The family's ideology then become a barrier for a very expanded way of developing for these kids. But this happens not because the, the families are guilty of anything. These families have, they have their limited ways of dealing with the world because of the oppression that we live in the country as a whole, as a society. So their cultural, historical background forces them to go through this privation, which then they create for the kids as well, because they don't have the access, because the government, because the state is not providing kids and parents with the necessary support so they can go ahead. So Sandra, can you tell us a little bit about this? Bom, nós não culpamos as famílias, Fê. Elas não têm acesso ao material digital da escola por conta da falta de estrutura, falta de equipamento, ficando cada vez mais isolada dentro de seus valores. É preciso que toda a comunidade seja envolvida em busca de pensar condições para que essas crianças possam ter seus direitos de aprendizagem garantidos. That's right. We are not blaming the families. What we are saying is we need to give support to these families. It's a community. It's a society issue. We have to provide them with opportunities to go beyond these limitations. And this is the responsibility of the state and of each one of us as part of this society. So what we have to say in relation to this is that for the kids, we have to say, express these ideas that you have. Use everything you can, your drawings, your gestures, your movements, your words everything to say what you think, what you think is better, what you think is your voice, express it. For the families, we would say, help your children understand that they can express their ideas in different ways, that there are many different ways that ideas can be conveyed, and that there are many different ideas, and they should be valued and respected. To the practitioners, to the educators, we would say, let's create opportunities for these kids to show their ideas, expand them, create them, teach them or us their dreams and wishes and interests. And for the researchers, we have to believe that all voices are possible and that we have to produce a kind of research that creates more equitable possibilities for the world. Like in our kind of research that puts together the practice and the university together to create solutions and create what we call a creative chain. So Emilia, can you tell us a little bit about the feeling that embodies these actions and the needs that we have? Dia a dia, nega-se as crianças o direito de ser crianças. Os fatos que zomam desse direito ostentam os seus ensinamentos na vida cotidiana. O mundo trata os meninos ricos como se fossem dinheiros para que se acostumem a atuar como o dinheiro atua. E o mundo trata os meninos pobres como se fossem lixo, para que se transforme em lixo. E os do meio, os que não são nem ricos nem pobres, com servos atados à mesa de televisor, para que aceitem, aceitem desde cedo como o destino da vida aprisionada. Muita magia e muita sorte tem as crianças que conseguem ser criança. Eduardo Galeano, A Escola do Mundo às Avessas. 
Thank you very much. Muito obrigada às minhas amigas, Sandra, Emília e a todos vocês. Thank you very much. And these are our references.